Gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, <laughs> calling the meeting to order the uh, March 21st, 2017 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Our agenda tonight has four items. Approval of uh, the meeting minutes from February 27th, uh, Maxwell's, Maxwell Woods Subdivision, Joel Fitzpatrick doing business as Maxwell Woods LLC is requesting a major subdivision review a resource protection permit for Maxwell Woods, a 38-unit condominium and eight-apartment unit development located at 112 through 114 Spruick Avenue, and amendments to a previously approved Cottage Brook subdivision to adjust grading adjacent to the extension of Astor Lane. Okay. Section 16-2-4, major subdivision review. Section 16-2-5, amendments to a previously approved subdivision. And section 19-8-3, resource protection permit. Under new business, we'll be uh, looking at Great Pond Preserve 2 resource protection permit in preparation for next month's meeting next month's planning board meeting when an application will be submitted the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is requesting that staff be directed to advertise for both completeness and a public hearing if application is deemed complete and then uh, the last item on the agenda is public comment on items that are not on the agenda oh. <laughs> approval of minutes from our last meeting are there any errors omissions do I have a motion um, motion to approve the minutes. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Before your seconds, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstaining? It's unanimous, I believe so. All right. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is Maxwell Wood subdivision. Uh, I'm not going to read that long paragraph again. Though. Yes. I just wanted to let the board know there's another meeting going on tonight it's a budget meeting and I'm gonna be stepping out for a few minutes when I get the wave and then I'll be coming back so be kind to me while she's gone will you so um, all right I'm not gonna read the whole paragraph again I just read it so Maxwell Wood subdivision so what I'd ask is that uh, the applicant come to the microphone and uh, update us on any changes and uh, and I'll just throw out right now, since I have the opportunity, I'm interested in a response to that laundry list of items from the town engineer. Okay. Um, let me start by, um, um, I have a, a presentation to address a bunch, a whole slew of the planning board comments. The town engineer's letter that we got this past week had a lot of, um, um, technical, I call them uh, nitpicky kind of things, which is fine. That's that's the way it's supposed to be, and we will be addressing that um, in the next plan submittal. There just wasn't enough time between when we got the letter and tonight to resubmit a plan to address all those comments. But um, I've talked to them. Uh, the comments are pretty straightforward, technical nature, and they all all will be addressed at the next at the next submittal. So. Um, we will be working on that. Um, I wanted to I have a sort of a brief presentation, well, maybe a little longer than a brief presentation, but I've tried to go through a lot of the comments and discussions from the last meetings because we've made a number of strides and changes to the plans to address some of the earlier comments. One thing I wanted to start with is um, in reading the public correspondence back and forth on the project. Uh, there's been some discussion around um, the development, the density, uh, the appropriateness of it within this area. And I just want to make sure we're all on the, uh, I think it's important to, to go back over into the resource, the intent of the, of the residential C zone. That is the residential C district, and I put the definition right up there because I think it's important includes lands that are within the built-up areas of Cape Elizabeth are sewered or can be easily served by public sewer and identified in the comprehensive plan as part of the town's growth areas. This project is within all of that. 
The other important key is that the purpose of the district is to provide for access to co of compact development that can foster cohesive neighborhoods that are close to community services. And I have a photograph, an aerial image later on in the presentation that shows um, the Spurwink Woods, the neighborhoods around. This is very compatible within that type of development in the resource zone or in the residential C zoning, which is where your public utilities are, where it's um, intended to foster this kind of development. And we are working completely within the confines of that, of those requirements, which includes the open space zoning. We have to have 45% as open space, which we do. And we are, the type of development um, is clustering it. The density, we're allowed 49 units in total. We're only proposing 46. That includes, it's based on the density that's allowed within the zoning. So we, uh, the applicant has spent a considerable amount of time before even getting to the planning board process to evaluate the land, uh, to look at what it, the uh, development can support to do a layout consistent with these requirements within the uh, zoning area. Another interesting thing is one of the goals of the housing goals in, in the town and, and I think this is consistent with some of the other um, results from looking at the housing needs in Maine is the comprehensive plan also identified their residents as they age. A lot of them desire, desire to transition out of traditional single family housing and uh, their opportunities uh, to remain in Cape Elizabeth are extremely limited. And I have a, um, an antidote to that or at least a, a story about that here in a minute. And so we believe the Maxwell Woods, because we're targeting at that demographic, very similar to what we did at Eastman Meadows. And in fact, in Eastman Meadows, a number of Joel's residents that have moved in there are folks that have transitioned out of single family houses. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, maybe Joel knows, but some of those folks have been within Cape Elizabeth that then have moved into the condominium. So the, we believe it's fulfilling a very important need within the community. Um, and I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we touched on that. The layout plan in front of you is um, the, the project, which includes just to refresh everybody. Um, it's proposed as 38 uh, condominium units with um, eight, two buildings, four units each. We'll talk about those buildings here in a few minutes. There's been a number of architectural changes done to that to help address some of the questions. Uh, private road within the condominium development that we maintained and, uh, and serviced by the residents of the condominium as part of an association. There'll be a new connection from Spurwink Avenue to the on Astor Lane into Cottage Brook. And I, I think it's important you have some correspondence from I think the police and fire chief that support this connection because it's a bit awkward in, the, in that neighborhood and this connection helps alleviate that. So there is a definite public benefit um, uh, to having that connection. So, and, and that road's about 1,200 feet in length and um, there's really no development along it other than the condominium and the connection to, to Joel's uh, proposed development. So we think um, that's an important aspect of the project. The next slide, I just wanted everybody, there's been a lot of discussion about what the condominiums are going to look like, what the landscaping will look like in it. And this is Eastman Meadows which um, is of the same development density, the same type, the units are identical. Uh, the driveways, the roads, the access, the type of landscaping that will be installed. And this gives you a sense of how the neighborhood is laid out and designed. It's nice to have a few photos from the summer, not with snow piles, but um, this is the Eastman Meadows project. And we expect that it will look very similar uh, to the uh, Maxwell Woods. Um, this road is, um, would be similar to the Astor Lane Road that's coming in with a sidewalk on one side. You'll notice that the esplanade here I think is five feet. We're actually adding two feet to the esplanade to uh, provide for better tree growth. But uh, there'll be stone walls, cur um, curbing, and sidewalk. 
Joel has spent considerable time when he developed the Eastman Meadows and as he will in this project to integrate in some of the rock walls, the ledge, the natural landscape to give it some interesting aesthetics on the project. And this will all be done as part of, of this project. The next one is the single unit, a picture of the of the single units. And now that's that's actually connected to another double unit, but that's exactly what the single unit will look like with the front porch. Uh, will be vinyl siding, uh, there'll be decorative garage doors with architectural treatments, gable, uh, roof ends, and Joel has actually brought along samples of the siding. It's certainteed, uh, monogram siding, it's about the highest quality siding you can get. Uh, the goal is to have a sustainable uh, development with nice treatments so that um, maintenance is relatively low, keeping costs down. In this case, you see a light pole out in the front, and I believe that is a brick sidewalk with ground landscaping around the units, which is exactly what we'll be doing for this project. Uh, just quickly, this is the floor plan of the single unit that was in your packet and was asked to be submitted uh, with the project. So you have uh, a garage so these are all one level uh, buildings, uh, garage, um, an office or a, and a bedroom, uh, living room, uh, there's room for uh, a deck off the back, uh, bathroom, another bedroom here, uh, a kitchen area um, in here, and a front porch. And these are designed around uh, all single level living, which is the demographics that we're trying to hit, uh, with two car garages. So all of them come with two car garages and basements. And some folks finish the basements, others don't, but the basements um, tend to be an important aspect of the, of the buildings. This is a photo of, at Eastman Meadows, of the two units, which will be identical to what we're proposing. Uh, variations in the building bump outs, variations in the roof lines, um, architectural shingles, uh, the doors are, uh, the garage doors are decorative doors to add appearance to them and varied roof lines. Um, he also integrates in not only clapboard uh, vinyl siding but the cedar shake uh, vinyl siding on these. And again, briefly, this is the floor plan for the duplex units. Um, if you cut it in half, you'd have the single, the single unit, which we have two of them on this project. This is the landscaping that goes on around the units. It's a mix of, of shrubs, um, a deciduous tree on each one, uh, with center planting in between the driveways. Uh, this is all taken care of on the outside of the units by the association. Uh, so that landscaping ends up being well maintained and it's symmetrical so that it provides a consistent, pleasant appearance for the development. And then Joel integrates in uh, rock retaining walls where we can uh, to provide some hardscape uh, with the project. At the last meeting, one of the questions we had, we had quite a discussion around uh, the fourplex apartment. and. Uh, we had, a, if the original building that was submitted had a gambrel type roof to it, that's gone. Uh, there's no port, there's no stairs off the front of the building. What you have is a very traditional uh, colonial type building. Uh, it's about, it's, it's not all the different that dimensionally than a very large colonial home. Um, you'll have it symmetrical on the front, landscaping around it, a front porch that with a sidewalk that people can go up, doors on each side, there's a second level. You have a gable ends facing the street. This is a view that would be facing the street. Uh, shutters on the outside of the, the windows, uh, large windows to give it some character. And again, there's a lot of symmetry uh, with the building. So, um, and we did bring along samples. Um, I, it, it's, it's certainteed vinyl siding um, on the project, but we think 
Uh, and in fact, the roof on the gable end that comes out to the front is lower than the center roof. And the, that center roof that goes across actually has a varied, comes down part way, and then the pitch changes, which comes out over the front porch. So we've tried to hear what the board had said about uh, the appearance of the of the units and have made a number of changes uh, to hopefully address that. I heard the, well, I listened to you, Jim, about the. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think it looks much better, in my opinion. <laughs> we do, we do, I try to listen. <laughs> Uh, this was the uh, landscaping around the front. Uh, the other one was the artist rendition, but this is the landscaping, which includes perennials, bushes, um, uh, and a couple of deciduous trees. Again, it's uh, symmetrical around the unit and uh, with bark mulch beds. The floor plan of it, this has changed from what you saw earlier because you know, previously we had that porch coming off and the because it had the gambrel look that's been changed around. So what you have is there's access to the lower units from the main floor uh, at the front of the building. There's no access to the two units on the second floor from the front side, the street side of the building. And that's on purpose so that we don't have stairs coming off. We want to keep that look that we just showed you. On the back side, the stairs are internal to the building structure. We had a discussion before about those stairs being external, uh, and there was a lot of discussion about trying to bring those internal to the building. So we have now all the units, upstairs and downstairs, have access from the back, and that's because that's where the parking is. If you follow the um, multiplex design standards, it's desirable to have the nice face facing the street with the parking in the back so that you have a nice presentation towards the street. So we've uh, strived to uh, make those changes. Uh, the second one's the second floor, very similar to the first floor, just that there's uh, no access to the, to the second floor from, uh, from below. There is a porch on the top, so folks can come out of their living space onto a nice front porch that faces Astor Lane. Um, it's a covered porch. I wanted to talk a little bit about open space because that has also been um, a central focus of discussion on the project. So the open space, we are required to have a 45% open space in the project. We're proposing a 46% open space. Now that open space is a co combination of preservation of agricultural land it's a combination of wooded area, and it's a combination of uh, maintained uh, lawn area. Uh, part of the open space will be owned by the association with, again, a public access easement over the trail system that will be put in, which is in this area here. Uh, this area over here, which is adjacent to the uh, multiplex units, we are proposing to give that to the town as town-owned public open space. The reason for that is that it makes a lot of sense because this is town-owned open space over here. The layout of the roads and infrastructure within it and within the development have been set to try to uh, work within the landscape to maximize um, a bulk area of preserved open space but also provide connectivity with the adjacent open space of, of Cottage Brook because there's a trail system that comes through here. And I have a landscape plan and a couple of perspectives that I'll show you here in a moment on what we're doing to achieve um, in that area through there. This side down here, there's a pretty good drop off um, on, in this area, wooded area here that will remain that goes down to that agricultural land as we've talked about in the past. The goal was to preserve that. Um, bluff so that as folks might use those public trails that come around it would be a nice view out over the pond and then down over the recreational or the agricultural land. Again these are here are trail links that the town has here that connects over to the Cottage Brook. Uh, the Cottage Brook development has open space here. We're adding to that open space for connectivity on the trail to provide better connectivity. Uh, this is a town open space here. We'll provide a trail connection through 
this open space here and we'll blend into this and I believe there has been continued dialogue around this parcel here as, as potential open space and then there has been ongoing dialogue uh, with Canterbury uh, folks about uh, trail systems through here. So this project is in a location that we think really uh, bodes well to, to blend in and uh, improve upon the open space and recreational opportunities. See if I can do the next. This is the blow up of it. So looking more focused at the, at the project, you can see the clearing limit here around the project, whoops, which is this area here. It's that squiggly line that comes across here. This will be wooded area in through here. This will be cleared over here between the units. Uh, but as you'll see in a moment, we have a plan to uh, provide some landscaping and trail. There's a real opportunity through here and I'll show you in a moment what we're proposing to do in through here. And again, the separation between buildings, the separation between Cottage Brook and this development are very consistent with the neighborhood. There's almost 90 feet of separation here. If you went over to, and I'll show you an aerial photo, if you look at Spurwink Woods and many of the other uh, developments in the area, uh, it's less than 90 feet. So. Uh, we have strived to, to, to really enhance that and meet that higher density goal with preserved open space. This is, this is between Cottage Brook and uh, Maxwell Woods. So it's about 90 feet from the back of these units to these units. Because of the grade differential in, in through there, um, it, unfortunately, most all of those trees get cut out. There's a pocket here that we think we can save, and we will. But what we're looking to do through here is, is build the trail system that comes through here. And in this particular area here, we're proposing to put in a stone dust trail and then take uh, using uh, boulder walls through here and over here, then with other boulders and mixed landscaping to define this corridor and buffer it for and with a meandering with a meandering trail through it connecting back up to Aster uh, Lane through the, in that location. So that this will be an inclusion of uh, rock retaining walls. It'll be uh, variation in topography. There'll be uh, landscaping with trees and low shrubs in through there and a stone dust trail through there. And this, this, the buildings, this was a, this is a perspective. And from here, this is about the face of the buildings on uh, Cottage Brook. And here's about the face of the building on Maxwell Woods. And it's the same on this perspective over here. This was a scaled um, section based on the grades in two locations to give you a sense of what we're trying to achieve with it. So there'll be the walking path, low growing vegetation with some trees, a mixture of coniferous and deciduous trees uh, with rock walls and then utilizing the ledge uh, for carefully placed boulders and landscaping along, uh, along the entire trail in that location. This is a slide I this is just a Google Earth image of the Spurwink Woods. And this is the most recent construction that's happened in the Spurwink Woods. And these, these buildings in here and in, in cases are within 20 or 25 feet of each other. We did a bunch of measurements. Backyards between units are 30 to 70 feet. Um, and the whole area is very dense, which is intended under the residence C zone. And we are developing consistent with those, those areas. Let's talk about traffic for a moment. In your most recent submittal, uh, main traffic resources did submit a traffic study. Uh, this is a paragraph right out of the conclusions of the traffic study that uh, by Diane Morabito that says these results indicate there's plenty of capacity in the existing roadway system for efficient travel. The new Maxwell Woods development as well as other diverted residential and cottage brook trips will have no significant impact off-site on traffic operations and such, as such there are no recommendations for improvement for capacity purposes. 
And Diane, we asked her specifically, there's the analysis is, there's two analyses in there. One is with the condominiums as regular, condominiums not age restricted or, or not, not based on age, open general condominiums. And the other one is with that. And even at the most highest traffic use, the capacities of the intersections, the capacities of the street systems can accept that. And the submittals that you have include uh, the synchro models that they run, at the, both the traffic lights and, and the intersections and at the entrances, and they did physical counts in the field. They routed traffic from Cottage Brook through the development. They routed traffic from Maxwell Woods through it. And I think they, inadvert I think her model even included uh, some traffic from, there's a connection road uh, that is gated. And I think she assumed that there was some of that traffic that might come through. And even with that traffic, even with that traffic, it makes no impact. So um, I, if anything, it, it, the model's conservative. So we feel very confident. It was a good exercise to go through. We hope that it provides the information uh, the town needs. Um, I, as I indicated earlier, we got a preliminary plan review from um, uh, Ransom and uh, Consulting Services. That came in just the end of last week, which is fine. Um, I've gone through it. Those are all of technical uh, engineering related items that we will be addressing before the next submittal. The last item I wanted to talk about on traffic is site distance. So when we went on our winter walk and excursion, uh, we went out by the intersection of Spurwink Avenue and proposed Astor Lane. What we did was, is we've surveyed this entire section along here. And following the town's requirements of a certain distance back from the edge of the road with a specific eye height looking at an object type, I think it's three and a half eye height, four and a quarter uh, approaching object types, we actually drew sections looking in both directions right through the land so that it's right from the eye, the elevation of the vehicle, making the turning movement out of the development, looking at the approaching road, the approaching vehicle. With a little bit of tree clearing on this side, uh, there's well over 400 feet of uh, visibility on this location. On this side, what this shows is this is a ledge outcrop that's in this area here. I tried to color it the same so you could get perspective of it. But there's a ledge outcrop here, which is here. And if you look at the line of sight, that ledge outcrop does interfere with the line of sight. So what we are proposing to do is remove that ledge outcrop so that this is the proposed grade right here, through there. So you have a clear line of sight looking back towards Route 77 that approaches three, I think it's 290, 300 feet. Uh, the town requires 200 feet, I believe, uh, for that, that 250 feet, I think it is, for that location in which we meet. So we are achieving what's required. It was a, it's, it's an important and good exercise to go through, and we think that uh, we've met the standard of care we need to for the town's ordinance and to provide that, that safe traffic movement. And this was all done with, with grading plans, surveys, and um, going through that whole process. Again, I just, you know, closing with the slide, we've worked diligently to try to follow the requirements of the resident, residential C zoning, meeting those requirements of the open space guidelines. Uh, developing with a density consistent with the goals of, of, of the residency zone and we we're, we're, think that we're well on our way to, to providing a development that meets the, the requirements of that area. I did and I, I, won't, I won't go, I can, <laughs> but I won't. One of the requirements or one of the things we submitted with this last submittal was a response, there's an 11 page cover letter that I submitted with the application and that 11 page letter goes through the ordinance for the multiplex standards the design standards, it also goes through the open state standards. I stated what's in the ordinance and then what our response was, how we were trying to meet, how we we're proposing to meet those standards so that it's very clear the steps we've taken to achieve that. I'm, I'm more than happy to go through those, but I assume that everybody's read them and I'll be glad to answer individual questions. But 
Um, with that, Joel, do you, Joel Fitzpatrick is here tonight. Um, Joel, would you like to add anything? Thank you. So uh, there was one question that was asked to us. As I, as I stated earlier, we, this, and actually this plan shows it pretty well. Um, along through here, there is some open space that will be maintained lawned area. That's part of the association, um, it, 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 and it's part of the open space. And, and our calculations show, we, we looked at that, our calculations show that on this parcel uh, of the open space, um, we are only 20% of this is lawn area. The rest is wooded and natural state as it is now, which is the agricultural land and the trees around here. So we're keeping 80% of that area. Again, it's mode open space. The, it's interesting that um, the way the, the ordinance is written, this is consistent with, and Maureen just left, so I can't ask her my question. So <laughs> timing. Although it's question. Yeah, so um, the ordinance defines open spaces can be up to the building line. Um, we are setting it five feet off the building line because there's a drip edge and some ground plantings and things around it. So we've held it five feet off, which is also consistent, which is what, what was done in the Spurwink Woods development because their building set back, or their building envelopes five feet off the building. So, um, and we've done the same thing with the uh, open space in uh, Eastman Meadows. So we're trying to be very consistent and within the definition of, of what the open space is. So, um, and I was going to ask Maureen if, if she had any follow-up on that, but I can't, so we'll wait till she comes back. <laughs> um, with that, we're here to answer questions that the uh, board has. We hope we've touched on a lot of the, the items that um, you had at the last meeting. Thank you. Oh, it's before you sit down. Could you, uh, do you have a slide? in your little packet there to show us what you're talking about as far as the grading and the Cottage Brook amendment that you want? That, um, you have that is actually one of the engineer drawings. So, and I, if I, I'll go back and I'll talk you through it. Unfortunately, just to give, just to, because part of this is an amendment to Cottage Brook for oh. grading for the road. And just to have the full picture before we yeah. we uh, open this up for public comment. Well, I guess I uh, the best thing I can do is I'll get through to this. I'll go back to the end slide here again. So in Cottage Brook, the road currently ends about right here. We need to make the connection with Astor Lane from here over to that road. That requires us to fill this area through here and regrade it, which we've blended in with the proposed condominium units. And there's a full engineer grading plan in there for it. Um, we will not be impacting any more wetlands than it was already permitted uh, as part of the Spurwink Woods and Cottage Brook plan, but it's all for this connection that comes in here. And since that time, I have a grading plan um, that was included in the package that shows what we're proposing to regrade at the backs of these units. So we have a cohesive connection between the two developments for that trail that comes through there. Um, we think that that is, is of paramount importance so that we can landscape it and make for a nice connection. So your plans have a grading plan with some grade changes at the backs of Cottage Brook and the grading plan for the road connection. And, and that's the extent of it. And I talked to Maureen when we come in for final plan submittal, she's asked that we have one plan that is specifically dedicated for that and we will do that. I knew it was in this big pack. Yeah, I didn't know sorry, the there was, picture. what, 38 sheets in there yeah. or so. <laughs> right. Hopefully that's enough information for this evening. Um, as is standard with any, any meeting, we open up for public comment. So um, 
I'm going to open it up for public comment if anyone would like to ask questions. Uh, please clearly state and slowly for the Secretary's purposes your name and address and you have three minutes to speak and you want me to time it? please sir would you thank you and the, there you go Michael Layton 17 Canterbury Way I, a question just came to mind is what's is there anything to stop after the development is all done they have their association from them cutting down any of the trees that act as the buffer yes there is there is yes thank you you cannot remove trees that are not part of the plan it has to be stated on the plan as a, as a, in order for them to be able to do that uh andrew gilbert 32 astor lane i just uh you say that slower sorry andrew gilbert 32 astor lane um one question and a comment uh one is that you know the the development the uh, uh i guess it would be Spurwink Woods, I'm not sure what uh, the Cottage Brook. Cottage Brook, I guess, development is proposed to have a trail around it. And, and I actually think, and it's hard to see on that, on I think one of the previous views, but on the, it would be the east side, there is a trail I think that's been proposed, but up till now, because the development's not finished, it's sort of just very nebulous as to where it, it actually is going to be. Um, and what I sort of worry about this is that this trail has been proposed, and I know it was sort of mentioned that the development phase was going to be just one phase, so it would all be sort of um, uh, graded and everything at, uh, right from the start. But what I would hope is that actually that the trail then would actually be put in at that point. And because otherwise there's, you know, sort of a nebulous period of time when nobody really knows when this is going to happen and and then the connectivity is kind of lost so I'd hope that the board would uh, have a plan in place and, and a requirement that it's it's the trail even though maybe the the landscaping is not done hundred percent but at least it's roughed out and in place for people to use ahead of time and my other concern and I've never heard anything about this and I'm not sure what the town's plan is but who actually checks to see how that's done, if it's done, how well it keeps up to the standards that were proposed. Um, and I'm not to suggest that it's not going to be done well or at all, but I, I don't, you know, I don't know whose purpose that, who's, uh, or whose job that is, and it would be nice to, to know that that was part of the whole process. Um, so basically a timeline of like making sure it's done and so that the, the town knows when it's going to be done and then that somebody actually looks at um, what was done after the fact. Um, and then I had one more question that uh, goes back to the prior Cottage Brook development is right now where Astor Lane Road ends, there's actually a very steep drop off on that area that goes down to kind of a wet area. And I don't know if that's planning to be fixed in all of this. It, it seems very, I have no idea how that all fits into the plan, but um, certainly if they're talking about regrading between the two, uh, it seems like it might be kind of a dangerous area um, as it currently stands, but I don't know how that fits in. I know it's Joel is working on that as well, so I would just ask that maybe either a comment about that or that it's considered. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello. Um, Becky Fernald, 313 Mitchell Road. And I just um, had a question again about the open space. Um, I just I'm, don't know how this really can apply to the ordinances, which uh, one of the standards talks about maintaining the natural features of the area, um, and especially in such a way to um, add to the attractiveness of the subdivision. Um, and it, it says the applicant, whenever practical, shall be required to preserve natural features. Um, you know, it talks about preserving uh, trees and um, unusual striking topographic features, which if preserved would add to the attractiveness of the subdivision. And some of the most attractive aesthetic values of this property um, are being demolished. So my question is, 
how does that apply to the ordinance? And I, I was reading Maureen's memo to the planning board tonight where it just says almost the entire property is wooded and development res will result in clearing most of the forest to accommodate new construction. How does that comply with the ordinance? Um, and why can't this construction, why couldn't it be redesigned to preserve the most beautiful parts of that forest? I appreciate the fact that there's 46% when they only need to do 45% but can it be reconfigured? Um, the part of the open space is the agricultural land, which currently has buildings on it and a lot of farm equipment. The open space is supposed to be usable land for the, um, for the public, and I don't see how that is you know, as usable. Um, I would think it would be highly beneficial to the residents of the surrounding um, developments and in, in the proposed development to preserve the most striking features of this land. I've, I've seen you know, different condo developments in Cape. Um, I've been to Eastman Meadows and that was a nice open meadow and they've, you know, so it has the sense of a meadow and it's surrounded by beautiful woods. Um, the uh, Hobstone has um, cluster development but they have large expanses of woods in between those clusters so it's a very attractive um, you know, a uh, view for those residents. Uh, the way this is structured, it's sandwiched in between two condos, condo developments that um, uh, really disrupt the topographic features and the, and the natural beauty of the area. And I, I would hope that it could, there could be some consideration given to maintaining more of that natural beauty of the area that would be more appealing and more attractive to prospective buyers as well as to the currently existing residents. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Sorry, I'm late. Uh, John Powers, 12 Astor Lane. Uh, I moved into Astor Lane five years ago. And I had the opportunity to walk all this property when I was considering buying. And I saw it as available land that could be sold at one point. I recognized that. And now we're there five years later. And, um, you know, when I moved in, this was private property that I walked um, through, uh, I guess, the gener gener generosity of the family to allow us to walk that property. But it was still private property. So we're gaining public property now, uh, uh, save space uh, to, to have land, to walk around. So I f thank the, pro the project for giving us this land. Before, when I walked it, it was a lot of fallen trees, um, a lot of at least three different areas where teenagers went and partied and had bonfires and didn't take care of the property. Uh, this shows us an opportunity to have well landscaped well-designed property and uh, new trails that I think would be easier to take advantage of, uh, easier to walk around with pets, easier to walk around with families. Uh, I, snowsho I snowshoe through here and on the back of my property. And I, I just say I welcome it and um, I appreciate the extra 1%. And I understand on this side, or the lower side, that there's a ledge there, so I understand why that is being preserved and it can't be reconstructed. Um, so I just want to say I, I support the project in, in every way. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Fred Sprague. I'm the president of uh, Canterbury. And um, one of the things I've been working with, or we've been working with with Maureen, is trying to manage. We have a significant amount of land up beyond that. Um, we have a pool and tennis court up there, uh, which sometimes is difficult to keep people off from, but uh, we're trying to find a way to manage that property to help the town with their trail system and to help protect our property from um, trespass, so to speak. Um, and it's not an easy process. Uh, we have uh, 40 some odd acres there where there are 
old growth woods like there are here. Um, but because we haven't uh, tried to manage that property uh, very well, um, we have, a, uh, I would say, a war rabbit warren of trails up there. Everybody who felt that they would like to walk around in some woods went up there and made a trail and walk wherever they want. Um, we want to try to help that be calmed down a little bit. So I've been trying to work with Maureen and the town to limit the trail system that's in there. Um, there are way more trails than there should be for that kind of land. There's quite a lot of wildlife in there. Um, I don't know what the town uh, does in support of wildlife around, but uh, that's probably one of the few areas, at least around us, where there's deer running around and turkeys and things like that. So I think it's important, um, and we're trying to figure out how to meld the, uh, there's a, uh, what do you call it, an easement that the town has for running straight back down towards, uh, well, down this way. We're trying to maybe adjust that a little bit for the trail because the trail, um, it's not good land use of that trail. We probably should allow it to be somewhere else. Uh, so we're talking about that. And we're trying to work with the town to make that happen, but we want to be sure that there are access points and exit points and that the trail systems merge with this development so that it makes sense for the town and for us. And the town has offered to help us in managing that trail system. So we're, we're taking a few steps to try to see how we can do that. Uh, but our road system is private and needs to remain private. We don't want um, tour groups running up and down our road system. So um, we have to work with the town on that, and I think we're making some pretty good progress there. But what I would like to know is what's the town position about wildlife and those kind of things, and how can we work together to do that? I mean, theoretically, uh, that land could be at some point, I suppose, developed. I don't know that because I don't know the history behind it, and I know that that uh, we get a tax break because it's not going to be developed. So right now it's open space, uh, and we don't mind people being there, but we'd like to limit how they access that. Fred, and you need to wrap up. Hmm? You need to wrap okay. up. Okay, and so I'm trying to work with the town on that, so we'd appreciate the help that you can give us to kind of manage that and make it blend together. Thank you. Hi, I'm Emily Hellison at Levin Hamlin. Just a couple of quick things. Um, I had some questions on the elevation on this um, in regards to the sidewalk, the trail, and the parking lot of the apartment building. Um, I believe from looking at everything I can get my hands on that the parking lot is going to be about 10 or 15 feet above, and I could be wrong, um, where the trail is right there. So I like to know kind of spatial wise, when you're walking on the trail, is there gonna be a gravel wall right next to you or is there gonna be a decent buffer um, next to that? And then um, when the trail crosses the road, which is elevated, what's that going to look like? Um, is the sidewalk gonna be at the same elevation as the road? Um, and then as Andrew said, as far as the timing of the trails, um, the trails in Cottage Brook have not been put back in yet. And you can see how they've done all the grading, but when they did the grading, they didn't put the trails in. And so in one point, there's a bridge, and then there's kind of a steep embankment, and then there's a sidewalk. So are they going to put stairs in? Like kind of how is that going to be established? And could that happen first before they clear cut all of this so there's still some trail of connectivity? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, Philip Hanratty, live at 111 Spurwink Avenue. Did you say your name was, sir? Uh, Philip Hanratty. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of more of a comment question mix here. And as someone who lives very close to the entrance of the proposed development, um, 
My concern isn't really in the design aspect, the open space or anything, but more in terms of uh, the timeline and sincerely the traffic impact. It sounds like there was some studies done on the traffic impact. Um, for me, living pretty, pretty much dead across from the Maxwells themselves, I can say to the left of our property there along Spurwink, there is a pretty large grade in the road there, a hump, in between the area of my house specifically to where this entrance is. Now, moved into this property eight years ago now, and over the years, as we have three children, our house is expanding, we do a lot of work on the house, we've noted more and more the kids can't be out front of the house because the traffic down the road is pretty intense. Intense enough that one night a couple of years ago a car crashed into a tree in front of our house coming over that hill, losing control. So it makes us a little nervous still knowing there's one access point from our road to this development of proposed 46 houses, um, which great, a study's done, but there's no denying that, that every day there's at least 46 people coming in and out of that development right there. That included with the speeding that we note down the road and the, the blind spot almost there of that curve actually over a hill to that. Uh, that's a concern to us. So um, my comment would be more for the town in regards to the developer and the discussion of within their study, what proven points that they have to show that this isn't an impact to the road. Um, to us, it obviously would be an impact because there'd be more traffic. Furthermore, uh, long term, what has been proposed is six years of development. Um, if it is Canterbury, that, that's the other side of that. Forgive me if I'm wrong on that. But um, that's already been developed for years now. So every summer, there's multiple trucks going back and forth down the road. So we're looking at another six years on top of what's already been developed, not a starting point. Continue the last four or five years, we've already had that coming back and forth. So we're adding six more years to that, which is great for the development of the place, not so great if you actually live on Spurwink Avenue, as that's the only access point it seems to be going back and forth. So is the, does the town have a timeline that they will be enforcing with the developer to ensure that this ends in six years? Much like other people have noted before me now, um, there was talk of trailway systems, et cetera, et cetera. None of those have seemed to be met so far. Was there deadlines with those? What is the, the protocol here to make sure this this ends on time for the residents who already live <laughs> there. That's simply it. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else? We good? All right, I'll end the public comment section. Uh, Owens, would you like to respond to any of those? Sure. I'm sure you can answer the one about who is checking your work. They left <laughs> a pencil up here. Was this? It's up here. <laughs> um, well, let me uh, kind of go back to some of the. Uh, let's talk about the trails. Some of the comments came around Cottage Brook and the trails and uh, timelines and who checks to see if the work has been done. So, uh, construction by nature takes time to complete. Cottage Brook was started last year in the summer, uh, winter came on. Uh, Joel will be returning in the spring uh, to continue working on Cottage Brook, uh, at which time those, the trails will, will go in as part of that project. The town has um, a pretty thorough process for when a development gets built. Uh, there's a performance guarantee that's posted, and Maureen, if I miss anything, maybe you could jump in and help me. But, um, and then there's an inspection program. So the town has a, a town engineer. In this case, it'll be Stephen Bradstreet of Ransom Consulting, who will do uh, inspections to ensure that work is being done consistent with the plan. Um, and then there's a performance bond put in place if for some reason a developer doesn't complete that, the town has the monies to uh, complete the infrastructure. Joel has indicated that in this project he wants to do the road and utility infrastructure in one phase, not break it out into phases. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that um, it goes much quicker if you basically take one construction season uh, to put the infrastructure and road in, and then it allows you to begin focusing on just the building construction. 
The second part to that is um, when you go in and you build the road and the initial infrastructure, um, that's the bulk of, of the, the big disturbance that happens. Um, you have to excavate the soils, you have to remove the rock, you've got to run the water, sewer, underground electric, you've got to put the gravel in, the paving, all of those infrastructures built, the stormwater facilities and ponds, and when you do it in phases that just prolongs it. Joel has made a commitment to do all of that in one phase, which means the Astor Lane connection will be built and Maxwell Woods Road will be built all in one phase. So the question is, is how long will that take? Well, it depends on when approvals. We have to, we still need to go through the DEP site law process. If we could get approvals and get started by mid-summer, there's a pretty good probability that we'll get base paving done uh, on the roads before uh, the construction season ends. If not, then it will span into two construction seasons. As far as going out further for a number of years, uh, what you would be seeing is just like a typical house construction. Um, the road, the utilities are all there. It's the individual buildings. So there isn't nearly as much activity that, that goes on. And Joel would love to sell all of these and build them probably in one year, but it's market driven. But the infrastructure will be in place. Uh, before you move on, is the landscaping and the trails part of that infrastructure? Uh, the road, yes. The, so the uh, around the roadway system and the trails would be done as part of that initial infrastructure. I, I would say that depending on the time of the year when construction starts, there is windows and when you can do the plantings for the landscaping, but that would be done as part of that initial construction. That's street planting, not any of the residential. Right, because that would happen as they're being constructed. Absolutely. Um, there was a question about on Mitchell Road that, and I, we've talked through this a whole number of times, but I'm more than happy to do it again, about the open space. So there was a comment that fills we don't uh, meet the requirements of the open space. And I'll go back to the, what I submitted with the application, a very detailed explanation of how we're meeting the open space. The first thing is this zone, the resource or the uh, resident C zone looks to uh, have higher density development, clustered development, preserving uh, chunks of land and interconnectivity of space. And that's exactly what we're looking to achieve with this project. And I would say there was a comment about it being sandwiched between two condos. And again, I would say that there's 90 feet between those two condos. And when we add this additional open space, it actually doubles what's, what's beside Cottage Brook right now. And we're proposing to do a very specific landscape in a plan along that connection. So uh, we're confident, we're following it as to the T on the definition of the uh, open space. And Maureen, I would look to you to, you know, this is consistent with other the applicability of open space and other developments and how it's been viewed over the years? I'm going to leave that up to the board to decide. Okay. <laughs> that was a broad question. I'm sorry, Maureen. Right. <laughs> she was watching the hearings earlier. Yeah, she was in the other room. Um, the next one was the elevation of the trail and the parking. So let's 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 break that down with the parking. And I'm assuming it's referring to the parking out back here. If you look at the elevation of the parking, this section of the parking is actually lower than the abutting land. When you get down to this side, because the land is dropping off down towards the brook that's through here, then there's a fill that happens in this green area here. And the limit of that grading and activity is pretty much shown by the tree line uh, on this on this site. Joel and I have talked about uh, installing some boulder walls uh, to try and preserve additional landscaping off the end but certainly up on this end uh, this actually is lower than the adjacent land this is a fill in that location but it's all within the property within uh, the area that's shown on this plan. 
Um, the other, uh, the, again, the timing of the trails, um, I think we just talked about that. So uh, the trails would be, you really, you have to get the road infrastructure in because on this project, basically when they build this road infrastructure, they're going to go in and remove all the ledge in this area to create the building pad. So all that disruption gets done uh, initially as part, of the, uh, as part of the first phase of the project. The road gets built and then each individual unit gets built, uh, built over time. Okay? The trails, once this infrastructure gets done and the mass grading work gets done, then the trail system can get installed. And that would happen in coordination with this work. If the timing is such that uh, we get started early enough this year, you could see them in by the fall. But if we get uh, started late and winter comes and there's snow, uh, basically construction shuts down and it would have to be the following spring. So, but it is going to happen as part of that first phase of the infrastructure. Uh, the roadway, there was um, expressed concerns about car crashes, access at one point, speeding on the road, a hump in the road. So um, if you look at the traffic study that was done by Diane Morabito, um, she went out and counted the vehicles, ran it through the modeling software consistent with what traffic engineers do. She's an independent traffic engineer, so we hired an independent to do it. They look at the capacity of the roads, the level of service of the roads and the intersections. And as she said, in it, there is plenty of capacity within the roadway infrastructure to meet it. And that's coming from Diane, who's got 30 years of traffic planning, and she's a, a known traffic planner um, in the main community. The other piece of that is, is, as I indicated, we have a very specific site grading plan to meet the site distance requirements that this town has established, and that was shown on the plan uh, that I prepared earlier. Um, speeding along the road, I, I, I don't know what to say, except that's generally an enforcement um, issue. Maureen, if you have anything to add to that, I'm all ears, but you know, we went through the traffic study that we meet all the, you know, the road has the capacity um, the intersections and we're meeting the site distance requirements. I, I guess what I would say is that there is a traffic study that's been submitted and anyone is welcome to come to the town office and review the traffic study and read for yourself the methodology that was involved. Uh, the traffic study doesn't say that there will be no change in traffic on the roads. What it says is that right now there's this much traffic which equates to a level A grade of surface. And with the new development, there'll be this much traffic, and it's still in the level A level of service. So it says that the current road system can handle the existing traffic and uh, what I would consider a generous projection of new traffic without any identifiable safety problems or capacity problems. So. Will the traffic change? Yes, it will. Will it change to the point where it should be unsafe? Um, a professional traffic engineer has concluded that it won't using standard evaluation methods. And that information is available, like all of these plans. Any member of the public can come by the town office and take a look at those. So I would, I would encourage anyone who has questions and would like to dig into that more, feel free. I hope I caught them all if there's something I missed. Uh, there was a question on the steep slope and uh, Cottage Brook, and is that part of oh, the Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so the steep slope is there because when Cottage Brook was approved and built, the road ended. And so there's a slope that comes off the end of that road. There was going to be a guardrail put across. But since we're now going to make the connection of Astor Lane all the way through, that steep slope goes away and the roads connect. So now there's one uniform grade that goes all the way through. Thank you. Yes. But to, to go to the steep slope in the relation to the trail. So the trail right now yep. is, at, is at grade, and the, the, the Astor Lane is up here, and then we have the grade, and then we have new Astor Lane doing this. So I've spoken to the applicant and pointed out that uh, they need to figure that out. And it, I, I think it's fair to say it's on your to-do list. Yes, it is. The trail connection that's here that we're proposing, this is coming out right at grade. 
if you, um, at the road. So because we're making this an integrated plant, uh, trail plant through here, that opportunity gets solved. There is a steeper slope off the end here, and Maureen is correct, we are looking at that to look at switchbacks or uh, some sort of boulder retaining wall system to make it more conducive for the, uh, for the movement. Thank you. All right, thanks. Now I'll open up to the board. Would like anybody have any questions? Victoria, you had your hand up first. I have a few questions, and I'm, I'm not going to touch on any landscaping right now. These are just quick questions. Sure. Um, last time we were here, um, I asked if you could uh, label that little wetland that's on parcel B, that it's RP2, just so it's labeled. Uh, you were going to label Astor Lane. You're going to add drive to Maxwell Woods. It's still drive, right? I mean, I read in the deed, it's called Maxwell Lane. It's called Max. Uh, yeah, it should be Maxwell Woods Drive. Yeah, OK. Yeah. We, the we'll deeds be. are, it's a draft. You'll pick up on that. Okay. Um, you. Can you add the book and page to Cottage Brook subdivisions label and the book and page to the Canterbury Hill subdivision? And the book and page to the new Bamford lot that's on Spurwig? Yep. That little one, and you were going to correct the spelling of um, Petrina Owen's name. Oh, so I appreciate that. that. Um, okay. Um, I may not have captured. I, I, I was writing as fast as I could. <laughs> uh, and um, I have a question. Did did I see that you do are going to propose to have a sign now that indicates Maxwell Woods? And if that is correct, I think I read it. Is the sign, um, I think I know where it's located, but was the material, the size, was any of that information in any of these 32 or so plans? Not at this point. We simply were trying to determine where we wanted to put the sign first, which is up here in this location. Joel is considering what he would like to do with the sign, uh, if it might be similar to what he did at uh, Eastman. Eastman Meadows, thank you. <laughs> and so, but we'll have something for you. Okay, that. thank you. Appreciate that. Um, uh, just kind of picky, but none of your um, elevations and floor plans have any sheet numbers. Some of them aren't even labeled. It's, it's not part of the ordinance, but it helps with the discussion. But yeah, anyway, those plans were prepared by someone else, but I uh, can see if we okay. could. Okay. Yeah. All uh, right. I'll, it's just FYI, they're not labeled. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Sheet number seven, uh, the open space B. Yes. Um, the square footage differs from sheet two. And this is different than what the um, town engineer picked up on. That was a different sheet. So this is on sh sheet seven, not the same sheet that the town engineer picked up on. Mm -hmm. The open space B, square footage differs. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, I, when I was looking at the uh, a note about affordable housing units, I saw the word phasing. Could you go into that a little bit more when you use the term phasing, what it means in this? In this case, we're not proposing any infrastructure phasing. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it would be around timing when the affordable housing uh, gets built. And Joel, do you have... Can you respond to that when the affordable housing would get constructed or what the timing of that would be? I believe in the ordinances there's a, there's a uh, provision for the timing of building the affordables. It goes by permits issued for the amount of units we have. I, I, don't, I can't quote it right now, but it's in your ordinances of when I've got, when we required to build those. Why don't I propose yeah. this? I Maureen's will... going to help with that. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the, this project is a major subdivision, so it must comply with the mandatory affording, affordable housing provisions. And those provisions include a requirement that the affordable housing needs to be built before the end of the project. Because, you know, if they wait till the end, not, not this developer, he's built much affordable housing. It's always been in the right timing, but we did have a problem with someone else. So I believe he's referring to the fact that he is going to comply with the requirements for phasing in the mandatory affordable housing provisions, in that those units will be built at the time they're supposed to be built and not at the very end. Okay. Okay. All right. I just. Maybe I, was, I could clarify. Maybe I could just refer to the ordinance timing or something. Is phase, I mean, is the phase, should I change that? The word phasing may be problematic. Yeah, that's what caught me, phasing. I'll, I'm thinking. I'll change the language Yeah, I'm thinking that. just the opposite. You will put them on at the end, so. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, I just, it just stuck. stuck no, nope, thank you. Uh, let's see. Oh, in regards to the net residential calculations, um, and once again, maybe Maureen can jump in on this. Um, was the parking lot to the apartments, maybe for both of you, does that need to be included in, or ex ex actually taken away from gross to get to the net, the parking area? It, it is included in it. So. Oh, I didn't see it on sheet So the two. entire, it's part of the overall pavement, but I can break it out for you if you want. But we've included all of the Astor Lane, the entire yeah, right-of-way. I saw that. All of the road width of Maxwell Woods. And that. we included all of the parking at the backs of the apartments. And what I can do is just break that out to show those okay, numbers because, to you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I saw the two you pointed out. I didn't see that. And the, it, that's considered a driveway into the parking, not an access way into the parking, just to get just, my word. It's, my understanding is considered a driveway. Okay, that's the driveway. Then. But the parking itself has to be uh, removed. Okay. And the rest of my questions now do go to landscaping. So, uh, well, actually, you know, I really did want to hear some of the answers to the engineer's letter. Is, is it okay? I don't want to go through well, every single I, one of them. He did, Mike, he did specify that uh, that you would. They would be responding to those. So, my, we just. Well, I we, had one really specific one then. Uh, that's fine. I, I and, just. And this will be the intro then to the rest of the board to get onto landscaping, which kay. I think some people may have questions, but. Um, as you do calculate how much is um, open space, I was going through the sheets and I couldn't see where any uh, measurements, I couldn't see any distance, but I heard tonight that you said that you would be five feet away from the building envelopes. That's correct. And that's the start. That's correct. Okay. Because I wasn't sure how you are calculating the open space when I couldn't find any calculations that show where the mm. building envelopes, grassed area ends, and the open space began. So I was just wondering, how were you calculating that without calculations on the plan? So. Well, I'm assuming what you did, you use AutoCAD? You did. You probably drew a, your, your boundaries and then hit the area calculation and it spit it out, right? Yeah, it creates a polygon and then P -line. it comes out. Yeah. yeah, P line. So what happens is, is here's the property line that runs around here and then there's a line that shows on the subdivision plans that comes through here up through here off the back and that line is five feet off the backs of the units okay. so um, the marvels of computers these days we can um, have it create that closed shape and give us what the area of it is and that's what you're seeing on the on the plans how about the parking lot for the apartments? My eyes aren't strong enough to pick up. So on the parking apartment. lot, there's a line, there's a line that runs like this that comes off five feet off the back of the, of okay. the parking lot and back around to the road. So this area in here is part of the multiplex units, but the rest of this is all part of the open space. Okay, that was I had no idea that yeah, you are using computers these days to do that. Okay. <laughs> And now thank you, Jim. Maureen <laughs> yeah. has a question. So, I, I thank you, because I've been speaking with the applicant about this for some time, and I, I think he's got an answer here, and I just want to make sure I got it. So, Owens, I'm looking at this plan, mm -hmm. and it says at the very bottom, 80% preserved is wooded and 20% maintained as open space. So, so the 100% what? is the entire project? No. Including the, no. Okay. So the 100% is everything about the agricultural land? Yes. Okay. So this basically, it's this big, huge chunk that's the Maxwell Woods Drive and the chunk that's behind the agricultural, excuse me, the apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying that of that big, huge chunk, 20% is cleared, regraded, loamed and seeded lawn area. Correct. So that's of the open space. Yes. And that's been the question that the board should probably be aware of. That, you know, typically people think of open space as untouched land. But the reality is we usually get some of both. Most of it is untouched land. 
but we do have projects where there's some stormwater features in the open space, there is some grading, and I think it's important for the board to understand that some of the open space that is in this project is, is being counted, that it's going to be cleared and graded and loaned and seeded. And it should also be clear that the, the interior of Maxwell Woods Drive is not included as the open space calculation. That it is, is just, not. It's not part of the 46%. The so it's the part that they're talking about that's cleared is, is that area on the back side of those condominiums. And it's shown pretty well in color on one of the sheets. Yes, it is. But this, Very this clear. is something that I think it's important for the board to understand and decide whether they're okay with. I can tell you that I do staff the conservation committee and uh, as stewards of the Greenbelt, we're out looking at the open space that the planning board acquires through development review because it has trails in it. And uh, we do sometimes have encroachment problems. And that's why you will often get recommendations from me to start dropping boulders and fences because people get a little too ambitious. What, I, what we're observing is we don't get encroachment problems with condominiums because they're paying to maintain the property to a landscaper. And it's, uh, it's pretty amazing how straight those lines are that we're not having situations where people are starting to, you know, expand their backyard and have the compost dumping. So that's just something I thought you should know as you figure out whether this is a reasonable open space package. But within the triangle, that is not, that is not counted as open space no. in the calculation method. No. Right. Jonathan's well, turn. I have some questions on that. So essentially, what this plan calls for is on the border of uh, Cottage Brook and Maxwell Woods. The condo owners will have five feet of a backyard before it becomes open space, correct? Well, in the condominium, they don't have, in a condominium, they don't really have any backyard. Okay. Because they That's own, they own within the building units only. Okay. So the condo association land ends five feet beyond their backyard. Mm -hmm. And if a member of a public, once it becomes open space, can come up and not be trespassing as long as they're five feet away from those condos, right? So this, these is, these, the open space associated with the condominium it remains as private open space as okay. part of the association with a public access trail in this location. So the condominium could enforce that, you know, if somebody want, wandered up to have a beer on the back porch I, or something. I understand but, <laughs> this side of the, the land. And yeah. you're saying that you got the condo association is going to maintain that back part of the lawn that goes up to the tree line. Am I right yep, on that? That's correct. I'm, I'm focusing on the part with Cottage Brook. Oh. Oh, over here. Over oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So that's what I'm asking about. So you're saying that the, the open space, the association property ends five feet beyond or five feet away from the, the condos? See, um, okay, I'll make sure I understand the question. So five feet off the back of these units yes. is where the open space begins okay. to the property line. And this property line, which is right here, so between that property line and that five feet is open space. Now that stays as private open space within the condominium. What, and then you come to this line here, the property line, and then over to this dash line on Cottage Brook is public open space in through there. We are going to be constructing the trail that will run a little bit on both. That trail has a public easement over it so that people, the general public has the right to use that trail. You know, they don't have the right to come up and roll out their sleeping bag on the back side of the, the unit, but they absolutely have the right to use that trail all through there. The association, what will be interesting is, is the landscaping that we're putting in. Here's another nice advantage with condominium associations is that that association maintains the landscaping in, in perpetuity as part of the association. Right, but Cottage Brook and Maxwell Woods are going to be two separate condo associations, They'll be two right? separate condo associations, correct. So in essence, they're two different property owners. That's correct. And they don't share the same land. No, they don't. So they're, one of the requirements that we look at when it comes to subdivisions is buffering. And I know the sort of the understanding here is, yeah, well, these Cottage Brooks and Maxwell Woods are being developed by the same developer. 
Therefore, they're going to be one cohesive neighborhood. They're going to be a sort of a unit. I think that's the idea that I'm hearing. Um, but we have in our ordinance that buffering has to go to um, maintaining that uh, the area around the perimeter of the proposed subdivision to provide an adequate buffer, reduction of noise, separation between the subdivision of budding properties, and enhancement of its appearance. And from what I'm hearing, the only thing that we're going to have showing a division between these two pieces of land, Cottage Brook and Maxwell Woods, is going to be a, a trail uh, with some retaining walls and some uh, boulders and some plantings, correct? There'll be, there'll be a full landscape plan all the way down through there. Okay, but trees that landscape plan is going to mostly consist of what you told us about, the boulders the, and some tree it'll, planting. It'll be a combination of hardscape boulders, um, uh, boulder walls, uh, sh low shrub plantings, deciduous and coniferous trees along that whole corridor to create that, that to define that trail corridor and create that landscape separation between the two projects. Okay. And my my concern there, and so I'm showing my hand, is that's what I want to do. I <laughs> sure, no, I appreciate um, that. My concern is that I don't know if that's going to be enough buffering for me. I'm not saying I speak for the board, because I'm sure there's some disagreement on that. Um, but um, I have concerns when it comes to um, that buffering that's going to happen between the properties. And I think a question was asked, not by me last time, um, but what the question was how much could we lose on a units before this doesn't become economically feasible? Mm -hmm. um, we received some very uh, nice and uh, well thought out letters from the Maxwell family that I really respect and understand with regards to private property and uh, the ordinance. And so I'm not trying to say I'm, I'm trying to derail any projects whatsoever. However, I, that is a concern that I have and it didn't really become noticeable to me until we went on that site walk about how close these two properties are and whether or not there's going to be an adequate buffer between them. I understand that there's sort of an idea that, well, Cottage Brook is being developed by Fitzpatrick and this one's going to be developed by Fitzpatrick and Associates and therefore it should be cohesive. I just don't know if I'm satisfied when it comes to the buffering. So can you answer that question with regards to the units? And Number of units. Uh, I'm going to let Joel talk here in a minute. but. Uh, Joel and I have talked about that. So what you have to understand is when, when a, an applicant or a developer, because I've worked with a lot of them over the years, the first thing they do is when they look at a project, they're looking at what that project can yield, uh, how many units they can yield. Then they work with the landowner to come up with a price. Now, the, in Joel's case and, and many of the other developers, they have investments in land. Then they got to go through approvals. They have to build road and utility infrastructure. They don't even know what all those costs are until they get to this point. Then they start looking at those costs. So they spend all of those costs and the, the money within the first year or two with v no return on the investment at all. Then they come in and build units. And many of, the, many of them um, take a lot of risk. They, you know, they, they look at it. They try to get a best sense of what they whether the numbers will work, but there's risk all the way along. There's, you know, I think of Eastman Meadows, Joel almost had to walk away from it because the economy turned around yeah. and went down. So there's, it's fraught with risk all the way through to, so the only certainty that Joel has, the only thing he can do is he can look at this and go through the planning and say, I can get these number of, of units and generally I think I can make it work. And each one of those units is, is very important to him and and you know that's how he starts all this process before he invests all this money and time into it and Joel I, I don't want to you know you, you may want to add to that well <laughs> the short answer there isn't any the, the, the short answer is that any deduction of units is going to hurt okay the everything everything all decisions right from the value of the property at the beginning for the beginning landowner is based on the zoning district it's in okay it's 
the value of the property for a property owner, sort of like uh, uh, real estate appraisal 101. Yeah. First thing they do when you want to value a property, you go to the town and you read the ordinances. You read the zoning ordinances in, you look at what you can and can't do, you look at what's allowed. The, basically, the value of the property is based on what you can do. So, the least, the lower the lots, the lower the amount the landowner is, the, the value of the property that the original landowner has, okay? The other factor here is that I've got, is this your pointer, Owens? Yeah, that's Maureen. I've got, from this point to this point, it's 1,000 feet. That's a town road, okay? That thing's gonna, that's 1,000 feet. That's gonna cost uh, 12, 11 to $1,200 a foot. That's a million two. You notice there's nothing on that road. Those apartments aren't gonna pay for a million two cost of road. That's gonna come here. These, these are gonna pay for that road. So basically, I need to make this work through the land, the cost of the land, the $300,000 I have into this today, so far in planning and going through all this, the cost of the road, that's the, and that million two isn't even including this road. That's just this. So building a road for a developer with nothing on it is, in my world, a really bad thing. You, you, you gotta have units on each side all the way up, or it, sometimes it's not feasible, unless you can get some density. So to answer your question, uh, the, the density is the density. That's as good as I can get. The, this buffer here is, we have 90 feet at the minimum between these buildings. You get to 100 and something here. That's more than c consistent with the development in, in the rest of the neighborhood. If you go, if you look at uh, Astor Lane, Hamlin Street, the older neighborhoods in the whole area, they're closer than this. The buffers are, are less than what we're proposing. So I, I don't know what else I can do besides boulders, landscaping, uh, what else would they be able to do? I mean, uh, get rid of that whole row of, of homes, and that's not, that's not doable. So basically, that's well, my answer. I mean, I understand, I respect what you do with regards to how much financially you put into it, and I understand that every time you have to come back for one of these meetings, too, it's not, it's costing you money. Um, well, and that's all figured in. See, this is where I, you do the numbers, you do the feasibility study before I even come here. And, and the, the, you, 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 that's how you, that's how we do this in my world, is you look at the ordinances, you see what's allowed, you buy the land, pretty much the decision on the payment you make to the, to the original landowner is based on how many units you can get. Your ordinances allows 49 units. I'm asking for 46. All right. Well, before I press any, you on this anymore, does anybody else have any concern with that buffer over there? If I'm not really getting much of a consensus, then I can well, move on from we it. we have but to see it. We haven't seen a plan of a buffer yet, so I think right. that We've, would be the first yeah. step is to yes. see the plan and We've, evaluate it. But I think we heard a lot about what a sort of a draft of that tonight with regards to the, well, you're right, we haven't seen it, and I know on one of the sheets that it said this is going to be provided to us in uh, the future, but, uh, but like I said, I mean, it's, well. I can move on if, uh, if I, I would say that you've expressed a concern. Certainly, information they'll take back as they're designing the buffer. Well, I think we've shown you something here uh, that's going to be darn good, good looking. But, but we'll oh, be seeing no. more detail. We're going to see. You're going to see more detail. We're going to see more detail on the next meeting. Detail. Right. And so you've made a start. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. As soon as I finish. <laughs> so I think. I think the uh, concern has been stated. Okay, I can move on. That's fine. So, go ahead. Yeah, you know, excuse me, with all respect to Jonathan's point, which I, I share his concern, but I think we're putting the cart in front of the horse here because we talked about that at the last meeting, and you have indicated in your plans that you have a more comprehensive scheme coming. 
and the buffering between these two um, developments is in a fairly small space, but I think all of us recognize from the site walk that there are things you could do there to break, and not to put up a barrier as such, but to visually break and blend the space between them. I mean, yeah, you put up a, put up a stockade fence, but that really would be undesirable. And but I, I think we're hoping you folks will come back with a more comprehensive landscaping plan that will address the point Jonathan made uh, and then give us something to really sink our teeth into. Uh, I'd also like to say too, I, uh, I, I get, uh, I can't back your view, John, about reducing the number of units. I don't think we have a basis to do that. Uh, he's, he's under the permitted density as we, as we speak and with the configuration of this lot, unless you wiped out a lot of those units, I, I, I don't see it possible, nor do I think we have the power necessarily to make them reduce units. Uh, my only my only thought on that was, and I know this might be a little bit far fetched, but was sort of just to change where the road for Maxwell Woods Drive uh, was going to be sort of situated, uh, so that the road, so basically that row of houses could kind of move further away from that border. We thought we thought of that, and we played with that, but it would bring the whole you, you picture that whole project coming closer to Canterbury, which. And, and it, with topographic, it just it, it works so much nicer this way. I mean, uh, with the trail on top of the ridge like that, um, and you know, we were we my thoughts were adding to some open space that right now Cottage Brook, my development Cottage Brook is is uh, the lot line is 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 close, and we're adding to that right now. Maxwell's Woods, what you're seeing there, is private property. Uh, so, literally, you know, 60 feet, 50 to 60 feet from my condos is private property. Right. It's going to be 90, there's going to be 90 feet there instead of 60. So, we, you know, we, we really gave a lot, and, and, and again, what I, my goal was is, is to keep the, keep the, pro, keep the project aesthetically pleasing, so that, that the, the great the top the graphical features of this property that's where the building should be is where I have them um, and I was trying to abide by the ordinances where the open space where we trying to big, give bigger chunks of open space and the small have small corridors to get so w basically what you'd be doing is if we moved everything down the strip of land would get bigger but the big chunk that I've been hearing everybody wants would get small. So we're, we're trying to, you know, yeah. uh, stick within the clustered provisions. You know, the other, the other option I have, which I don't think anybody's talked about, is carving this up into 34, instead of 40, 49 units, 34 half acre lots, and there'd be no open space. Lot lines were up against, it would be, there'd be none. And I could do that if we want to get rid of some units. That would be another option. But, you know, I've got, I'm so invested into this right now, and I think this is a better project. No, and, I can, and I've been through Eastman Meadows, and I know you do good work in um, well, it, you regards know, to that. So I'm not trying to suggest that. I was just asking the question, and uh, like I said, I'll move on for tonight, and we can come back to it if we need to later on. Yeah, well, the, the thought of, of deducting units is just a, it's not, it's not a, it's really not an option. If we had to do that, then I would consider doing the other, another way of developing. Okay. So. Okay. All right. Does All right. anyone else? Let, let me see if someone else has a question first. Anyone else? <laughs> Go ahead, Peter. What? Uh, well, I've lost track of the status of the agricultural land. Is that being conveyed to the condominium association in a easement back to the farm for cultivation? Who, in other words, who's going to own it? You're claiming three density bonus units from its existence, but I, I can't remember exactly how it fits. So the, the conservation land goes to the association, right? No, it state, does it stay under the... Conservation land? No, that's, no, that's the agricultural land. Agricultural thing. land is, is, going to, is going to stay with the Maxwell family. And? With, an e with a conservation easement over it, agricultural easement over it. 
So that will be, that stays with the Maxwell. It's really not part of this project. It is, it is part of it. There's a conservation, there's an agricultural conservation easement over it. Um, but the, ac the, the, the actual owner will be the Maxwell family. It's similar to yeah, I, my I, I, conservation land that the condo development is. is so this will be uh, for the conservation easement for the benefit of, of this development. It restricts this piece so that it, for perpetuity it can't be used for development, can't be used for anything other than agricultural land, which is the goal to preserve agricultural land. But there could be no, it can be used for building houses or building other developments. It would be preserved for perpetuity to count towards the overall open space. So the association itself has, and its members have no rights of access or passage over that they simply have the benefit of the conservation restriction that it can never be developed? Correct. Yes. And, and that'll that, be deed that, restricted. Give them the, uh, oh, go ahead, Maureen. And I apologize for not knowing this, but who is holding the easement over that land? Is that going to be conveyed to the town? Oh, the conservation easement over it. Yes. Uh, with, so the ownership, if I understand the easement right, the ownership stays with the Bamfords so that they can continue to agricultural, but the town has an easement over it that gives That's the town I mean. the right to keep as so open space. Similar to, don't listen for a second, the, the Jordan <laughs> family on Wells Road, where there's a, the, the, the land on the southern side of Wells Road is retained by the farming family, but there's an easement on top of the land that restricts its use to agriculture, and that's held by the land trust. In this case, the land in this project that is agricultural, the area would be restricted to agricultural uses. It would be retained by the farming family, but there would be a conservation easement that does the restricting, the muscle part of the restricting, which would be held by the town. In favor, of, yeah, no, and that, that, that's a, okay. all a, a wonderful thing. The only question I have, and maybe it's academic at this point, is that's really then not really part of this project. And I'm, I'm, I have a question as to how they can claim the three density bonus yeah. units, although they're not using them. Yeah, so and, it's maybe and um, I don't know if you remember the, the fun time we had with the land use amendment package. Um, but in that package, there was an overhaul of the cluster development provisions, what in Cape Elizabeth is called open space zoning. And the overhaul took the open space that was currently required and reformatted it to fit the future open space preservation committee recommendations. And the future open space preservation committee was a committee created by the council specifically to look at open space preservation in Cape Elizabeth. And as part of its work, it came up with a priority setting process. And it said its number one priority for open space preservation in Cape Elizabeth was agriculture. And then after that, it was wetlands, I think wetlands, agriculture, and I think agriculture was first, and then Greenbelt. So under our provisions, it says that you can preserve open space for agriculture, and it counts towards the open space you're required to preserve for development. And because we're trying to prioritize agricultural preservation, if you preserve agricultural land, you can apply for a density bonus. And this particular developer is telling us that he could apply for it, but he's not. So he's not, at, he's not getting the bonus for calling it agricultural land. He's preserving it as agricultural land. And if he preserved it as anything but agricultural land, he wouldn't get any more density. Is that clear? No, I, I agree with you. I'm just saying that he's never owned that thing in the first place. So I, he, if, if he right. were trying to rely on it, I think I might mm -hmm. ask some questions. But it doesn't really matter anymore. So. It, it doesn't. And, yeah. and you know we've talked about people acquiring property in other parts of town and preserving them as part of their development requirement. And it really is up to the planning board in the ordinance to decide if what the proposal, their, what their open space they're proposing complies with the ordinance. So you have to decide if someone wanted to grab a piece of land in another part of town, you would have to decide is this the land that's important to agriculture or wetlands or greenbelt and therefore fits in with our open space or does it not meet our needs and you have to try harder? 
The, the other thing is you haven't received comments from the Conservation Committee, which tends to provide you comments on open space preservation. Um, they hadn't provided substantive comments because they were waiting for this new set of plans, and then their meeting was canceled this month. So I'm hoping that, uh, because of the snowstorm, so I'm hoping that after their meeting in April, they'll be providing you comments in advance of your April planning board meeting. Is that too much? No, thank you. Victoria? Yeah, uh, just to jump, I, I, I agree what you were thinking, Peter. I was thinking the same thing because I'm, I'm reading on page 159, in order to create incentives for property owners to incorporate additional community goals, such as preserving the land we spoke of, we will give out density bonuses. I, I, I can't get how the property owner is the Bamfords and not um, what will eventually be Joel. I, I don't understand how, I mean, I think it's a great the, thing to preserve it, but the owners will always be Bamford. So I, I would suggest that the Bamfords are co-applicants in this project. Oh, okay. All right, because it just, and not that you need the density bonus. Um, <laughs> you're building less than the three additional. Right, so I'm not asking for kind it. Kind of a moot point, but I couldn't get it either, Peter. I can't make the connection. The open space that is on the south, the north side of Astor Lane will be owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Correct. He's referring to the, this piece over here. Yes. Were those deeds given to us? Were drafts of those deeds? I couldn't find them, but are they? Are there they were in the original, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, the original? T typically that, that detail comes out of the final subdivision review process. Okay, I couldn't find them. I think them. we had the purchase Oh, sale. ownership of yeah. the, the uh, purchase and sale we agreements the were in there. Yeah, but, I got the purchase yeah. and but sale. The but the deeds would, would come in as part of the final application. Yeah, that's part of our requirements is, it is the deeds yeah. do come in. I couldn't find those deeds. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Go back to you. Anyone else can go. But um, okay. Back to the landscaping. Um, the landscaping in the uh, parking area for the apartments. It says in our ordinance, parking lots shall be landscaped to soften the perception of an expansion of hard surface. I saw the front. I know you got new plans, more landscapings to come. Do you will be complying with? The parking area shall be landscaped. I'm anticipating that that's also going to come back in because that's part of our ordinance. So the back side of the parking lot um, yeah. is part of a the drainage infrastructure. Ah. Someday I'll get this figured out. All right, let's try this. Um, if you look on the engineered plans, which I didn't put in the PowerPoint because when I put them up here, they just look like a bunch of lines. So, uh, but on the engineered plans, there is a stormwater soil filter that's right on the back side of this unit to treat the surface water from the parking lot area. I'm not allowed to put uh, root bearing plantings into that soil filter. I might be able to. I mean, we're looking at doing some landscaping in these islands here and along the fringe. We're keeping all this as open space and we are preserving uh, some trees along the backside of here, but because of the stormwater drainage requirements, I can't plant down inside of that. Um, I have been looking at grasses and shrubs and something if we can put them on the slopes on the embankments but I have to be very careful because if I get down into the soil filter it'll compromise how that works but um, and that is part of the next submittal that okay. we're, I, we're working on. I can appreciate on. what you're saying you can't put them over there but yeah that would be I would be looking forward to seeing yeah. that in the next submission. Um, also um, in a letter dated March 6 to the town planner that transformers will be screened through landscaping. I didn't see it. Once again, it's landscaping and that's to come. Well, I'm, I'm hoping Jim will appreciate this being on the electrical well, side. I, so. I was waiting for a chance. You've got all these corrections here. Having been in your shoes, it's essentially a quality review and you're going to agree with some of them. You're not going to agree with all of them. And you're going to update the plans for the next issue based on what he says, based on what we say. 
Exactly. Now, as far as the underground electric, Joel just uh, recently got um, a contract number with CMP who will begin looking at the electrical layout force and where they want transformers. And then we will landscape those transformer pads around it. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll do it, and maybe this is the best thing to ensure because these pads tend to move around from time to time, is I can give a prototypical, because we know generally that we got a transformer, we got a telephone, we got a cable box there, and we can do a typical landscaping so that there is a performance standard around those landscapes. Okay, thank you. Um, at our last meeting, you did mention you were going to use pavers for the walkways, and tonight I heard brick. Well, so, they're pavers. Uh, oh, okay. So what? Yeah, I couldn't find um, in our plans what the pavers would look like. I was assuming one look, and now I'm hearing bricks. So I didn't find them there. But if you could explain what they'll look like, I, and, and Joel, if I get this wrong, you can stand up and jump at me. But I believe they're concrete textured pavers that go down. Um, so if you go to Jeunesse Concrete and you look at the they're made I'm out of concrete, plans, but actually, yeah, they're going but, to be in there eventually. right, but they look a lot like um, like a cobblestone kind of. Okay. But they're made out of concrete. Total is that? I can add a little bit to that. By the you know, by the time we build these, the if I give you a sample of that, they'll probably change because they change products all the time. It's going to be a concrete paver, and if you know, uh, the the products are changing constantly. So if I put in a certain type and color on the plan, by the time we go to do this they probably change. So if you're, if, if you're fine with a note on the plan, I was gonna say, and I would be looking for a note on the plan. Sure. Um, I, am I also to assume those same pavers would be used in the apartment sidewalks? Uh, excuse me, walkways? Correct. For the apartments? Correct. Front. Thank you. I wanted to know about that. OK. Um, Maureen, Victoria, you. Can you yield to Maureen for Certainly. Sorry. Can you circulate the exterior materials samples that you provided? Oh, the sure. samples, bro. You brought them with you. you. Might as well. Um, we could look at the apartment building. And I want to say thank you for making those changes on the apartment building. It's come a ways. It has come a ways. And again, these, these color samples, color samples can change with manufacturer. Uh, doing. That first one is the cedar impressions that that's going to be on the gable ends and also on the gables of the, of the apartment building. The, Will be on these the, ends, the, right? mono, the monogram um, is the cedar uh, clapboards. I mean the vinyl clapboard. And then there's color for the. And then there's the roofing sample. Do you have a color family that you use? Yes. Would you identify? Would you identify the color family you want, you want, that you would you use on? You would you like me to do that in the next submission or you would you like yeah, yeah. just sure. like you say the the actual shading may change but what is the family of color that right. it's going to be that, 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 would, that would be great if i could stick with the family of colors because every they're changing this stuff on me constantly so thanks for bringing that apartment building up um and as i mentioned it looks so much better um, I was reading the ordinance, and it does say, when the building is located within 100 feet of a public right-of-way, the front of the building shall be oriented toward the public right-of-way. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what that is, yeah. So you've changed that. They're not, they're now oriented Oh, towards well, the they're still they're angled. I guess I, 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 you know what, I, I hear what you're, I see what you're saying. So, uh, ironically, we thought it would be nice not to have uh, the units. Here, let me go back to that. I think I remember on the sidewalk, they're oriented. The front is facing. Um, the front faces. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I would take that as it's 
oriented towards a public way. I, I understand what you're saying. It's not perpendicular, uh, or excuse me, parallel with the, uh, with the public way. But I remember that was something you pointed out on the site walk of that sort of. We were, we were trying to give it some character so that it, it didn't have this linear look right along the roadway to have uh, some sort of a, of a little offset appeal, uh, you know, part of the building back further, part of the building a little closer. We actually started out with them parallel to the road, but we didn't really like how that looked, and we thought that they're predominantly facing the road, but they've got a little bit of, a, of an angle to them. No, the concern from the board. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I mean, actually, on the site walk, it is pretty simple. Is it? Okay. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, can I have the apartment building? Oh, there? sure. I forget what it looks like, so we're just seeing it tonight. No, no, that's fine. Okay, I was looking at um, the, the entry, the steps, because mm -hmm. in our... Uh, the ele elevations that we have now, which are not the same, I couldn't see if there were any um, prominent entryway into uh, this. So we do have the steps now, okay. And um, I couldn't quite understand when you were talking about the difference in the roof line. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, I'm sorry, I just- Oh, no, can't, no, sure, can't grab that sure. Concept. So the gable end, which you see here, so the, the ridge line of the roof runs into the drawing here. So th that this colonial bump out. So when you look at a uh, uh, traditional colonial house, you can see them have either one ridge line across, some build with a, a bump out with uh, part of the building coming out towards you, which is this gable end here. Okay. This, this ridge line is slightly higher than this, so that it has little... Uh, a little more appeal to it so that it's not one uniform ridge line across. Now, the shading here, this is the important part that I was trying to, there's a porch on the second floor. So the roof line, and now I'm gonna have to use my hands, I'm sorry. So the roof line's coming down like this from the top and then the porch comes out like that, a little bit flatter. Okay. So you have two roof lines going on. Is the front of the porch even with the gables, or is it step back? Joel, I don't remember. Is it? I think it's. Is it step back, or is it even with the? Is Go to the that? Uh, yeah. Good idea. Um, boy, it's darn close because here's the. So here's the. There's the support columns, and there's the roof line, of it. So it's within looks to me like it's within six, six inches or a foot, and it, it may actually be with the overhang, the soffit, coming off the porch. So it looks like it's pretty darn close. It will be stepped back. We do that for aesthetic reasons. It's, uh, you know, the gable ends will have a six foot, six inch overhang also. So what, what I did with that, with, this, with the original design versus this design, the main roof that goes from front to back, was going all the way from the back wall to the porch. I brought the new roof design on this one from the back wall to the... To so the, it runs like this, is that what you're saying? To this, to this wall. Originally, the roof line went from here all the way to here. Now I have the roof line from here to here with a separate roof over the porch to give the porch a separate porch look. And I, what I've, I'm in the planning uh, with my designer, I'm, I'm, I'm asking him to give me a, uh, a 3D rendering so you can see that a little better and we'll have that colored similar to this. So from the sides that the main roof is hipped, right? Dying into yes. Okay. So the, the main roof actually just goes from this back wall to this front wall. And then these gables die onto it. And then this little porch roof goes on to the main roof. It's hard to it's, it's hard to envision unless you. I know you're doing it. I'm having hard. Do you time. understand? Um, and, and in the back, I'm trying to in my mind 3D that. Are the windows grouped together in the back? Are those when? Once again, what would the back look like? Are the windows also going to be like I've, boom boom? Or are they going to be put together? We have a. a, a, a 
elevation that I'm working on. I've changed that a little bit. Uh, Here. Again, um, and this just, you know, work in progress here, but you've got bedroom windows here. Okay. We did have the back, we did have this door that was going, this door here goes into this living area. This door here goes upstairs into the upstairs. I had that door here, but since the windows are here, I didn't want a door there, so I changed it over to here. So this is just kind of a work in progress because there's going to be a walkway here and you don't want people walking in while there's a window. So I'm just going to move those windows over. Now, uh, so I'm still in the process of fine tuning this design somewhat. Um, that's why I don't have the back view for you yet, but we will have this. Uh, I did have in the back elevation uh, that you had gotten on your last package, the roof coming off for this in the rear for this section of stairs had the gambrel look, which we got rid of. So now it's got a shed roof on it, which I kind of like. I never really was a fan of the gambrel either, to tell you the truth. Um, so in well, order- It started with you, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm feeling the heat. Yeah. Kansas looking. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'll have a 3D, uh, it might be a little rough 3D, but then the, 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 the two left and right and the rear elevation for you on your next, next package. Okay, I'd appreciate that. And again, we, this, with windows and doors, is still kind of a work in progress because I, as I stare at these plans, I'm changing things like the window and the door and the privacy sake and all that. Okay, and I want it to look nice, yeah. as I know you do. Um, that, actually, I might have a question more for Maureen. Um, does the fire chief normally um, get back to us about location of fire hydrants? I thought that was something that the, was in the first letter from our town engineer, but I don't remember seeing it. I'll, um, I'll, I'll check with him. I know that the fire chief, I've been in the room and the fire chief has looked at these plans and his main comment is that he is very pleased to see Astor Lane be looped back and connected to Spurwink Ave, um, right. but I will um, ask him to comment on the hydrant. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I think that's it. It wasn't even an hour. I don't know how I did. <laughs> you guys all set for tonight? Yeah. You guys all set? Joe, you all set for tonight? Okay. So. We're all set for tonight. Would someone like to make a motion? And I do like it. It looks better. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, can I say? Motion. We need a motion. Can I say one thing before the motion? Uh, I thank you for the traffic study. That was one of the requests I had that it be included the other neighborhoods. So I appreciate oh, you sure. doing that. Uh, motion. Oh, Caroline, that's going to be. We got a message from the Bamfords regarding that this is still private property. I don't know if you might want to publicly <laughs> get into the fact that it's still. It well, that goes that goes for any property in town any you property. don't own. Then it is not marked as public access. It's private property, and you should not be going on it without the property owner's permission. Yes. So, oh, before the motion, I do have a question, and it made more sense a couple weeks ago before it snowed. Um, is there any interest in doing a snow-free site walk? And uh, I'm seeing one nod, one shake over I'll do here. One. one yes. Sure. So I can go either way. I probably should where I didn't quite make that first one. To, because some of the questions that keep coming up over and over and over again um, maybe could benefit from, we did learn a lesson, don't ever go for a site walk in a snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> One, I'd have one suggestion, though. I think um, it would be beneficial to have a fairly complete idea of that buffer before we go back there. I'd like to see the landscape plan and then go back. And so maybe we could come to the April meeting with the landscape, have the landscape plan, and then pick something afterwards. And, and we should be without snow by then. I hope so. I hope so. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about it again in, okay. in April. All right. 
Okay, motion please. Yeah, motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joel Fitzpatrick doing business as Ma Maxwell Woods LLC is requesting major subdivision review and a resource protection permit to construct a 46 unit project consisting of 38 condominiums and eight apartments uh, in two buildings located at 112 to 114. Uh, Spurwink Ave and amendments to the Cottage Brook subdivision to accom accommodate grading changes related to the construction of Astor Lane be tabled to the regular April 24, 2017 meeting of the Planning Board. I have a second. second. Joe? All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Oh, no, it's unanimous. I'll stop saying opposed. And Thank you for your time. We'll see you in April. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, next item on our agenda. Those are hard to come by, you know. I know, I saw that. Yeah, I got mine here. That's what I Good, thank you. All right, next item. I think we have another piece of paper in here. Received statement. All right, next item on the agenda Great Pond Preserve 2 Resource Protection Permit. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in, in preparation for next month's planning board meeting, when an application will be submitted, the land, Elizabeth Land Trust is requesting that staff be directed to advertise for both completeness and a public hearing. If application, if application is deemed complete. All right. You want to give us a little background on this, ma'am? Yes. So the the Great Pond Two Preserve, hopefully you all remember, is about 20 acres and it's located sort of at the end of Fenway Road, off Fowler Road, and the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is proposing a new trail network in there that will. I think it's going to have two wet crossings. And they came to the special February 27th workshop, and this is when this kind of thing is usually requested. So they're a little concerned with timing. Um, you have, they were unable to get their plans submitted in time for tonight's meeting, so they're going to submit for the April 24th meeting. You also have a meeting in May, and they're hoping to get their volunteers out there at the end of May. So what they really want is for the plans to be submitted for the April 24th meeting for you to deem it complete, hold a public hearing, and approve it that night. If you do that, you, which you can do, um, what it does do is it, it kind of precludes you from doing a site visit. Yeah, um, I hesitate not. You, you could direct staff to advertise it, in, but still, if you are not comfortable or whatever, you could still hold the public hearing and then table it on the 24th to the May meeting. Um, it's, it's your call. I, I know that the, uh, I have a couple kids that are gonna do a senior transition project with me and I think it starts May 15th mm. and goes this, for those three weeks, so. This, the I, I met with the executive director and the stewardship chair of the land trust and they told me that their plan is, I believe it's for middle schoolers to get out there at the end of May. Oh, okay. Which, if we look at our, I mean, unless they've changed their plan. Um, Aren't there child labor laws though? <laughs> no, it doesn't apply to the cell <laughs> project. So the May meeting is May 16th. And I believe they were talking about their, trend, their, their project being May 29th, 30th, 31st. So if it's May 16th, it's actually pretty early. This is a plain vanilla project of the sort they've done quite a few times already. I, I personally wouldn't object if we didn't have a site. I think we, it's your we, call. We know what they do. I, I don't know how the rest of you guys To doing the site walk in advance of, the, of receiving the plans? Oh, yeah. That's, that's why I'm just trying to clarify. Yeah, that'd be fine too. I mean, to me, it's not a too crucial thing because we know the kind of work they do. We know they do it well and only where it's significant so. or did you did you mean you would be willing to do it without a site walk at all either or okay I'm with Peter on that okay. I am too 
Well, and I was going to say, I always feel like we should get out and actually visit the sites. Oh my goodness, and there are only six of us. So, <laughs> um, whatever the rest of the board wants to do, it seems like there is time. I mean, if um, this doesn't get approved in April, the latest it would be approved would be May 16th. Did I hear that correctly? That's the, that's the May then, meeting. Okay, and then we put the eighth graders to work on the 29th, which is actually maybe two weeks after our 16th meeting, possibly. I'm doing my math. Yeah, but they may, they probably have to get stuff lined up, get it bought, and do whatever they're going to do. They do do that, and you need to you need uh, They have to buy things and get their act together. Probably two weeks may not be enough. And if they don't, if, we, if they can't meet that, then the kids are going to be scattered, and we trying to get stuff done this summer won't be so easy. Free. Could, yeah. could we do? I would be comfortable with doing a site walk just by looking at the plans before the application or the applicant speaks to us. If there is a, if there is a sort of a desire to have a site walk, I don't even necessarily need to do one, but. I guess I'm familiar enough with the trails that they've done before that I, I can side with Peter in, in the interest of time. I could go either way. I'm not kind of. Yeah, I just feel like we always should. We, I know. Visit the site. I, it seems. And I, maybe I'm often surprised when I go on. A, I I think yeah. I have a thing in my head, and I'm often. Surprised. I haven't been on those trails since high school, so. Yeah, I have. Yeah, but that was at night. It was so at you don't night. know what it looked like. <laughs> <laughs> these, these are different trails. Oh. <laughs> uh, maybe in April we could ask them if it if it would if, by delaying it to May because we about the site walk we could say is this going to um, affect having uh, the free labor put the boardwalk in because that's basically what it is they're trying to time it with an eighth sure. grade project and um, I know an eighth grader that's not particularly psyched to be doing this project so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, well, what's her name <laughs> <laughs> anyways um, in April I would like to just ask them and then maybe make a final decision in April and it so, could be no site walk in April would just ask them some questions would this delay them if with um, so if we were to um, review it for completeness and hold a public hearing in April and then decide we want a site walk, we could then table it for a final vote in or May. if we decide or if we, we decide we're fine, we could just finish go it up for that, it that evening. night. So what would the criteria be for deciding whether or not there was a site walk? I guess the Whatever majority, hear, majority I'm already hearing the majority well, say if, no site walk, but if you happen to hear something Maybe, but, and I understand your point, but going back to Jim's point about whether or not they need a final say on buying materials, if we found out information from the applicant um, that it would be, it might delay the project if they didn't get sort of final approval in April, mm -hmm. um, sure. could we readdress it or and with that site walk before? And the April me, meeting? Tell me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm going back and I'm remembering another submission from the land trust over in Robinson Woods, and it seems to me we did not do a site walk for that. No, we did not do a site walk for Robinson and, Woods. And they're coming back to remind to review that. They have to make changes to that layout. Can we have a site walk before April 24th, or is that not legally your? Well, usually the challenge is that you want to have plans you when you do your site walk. You want to have reviewed it and know what you're looking at. Before I mean, you. We had a workshop presentation, so we have the general. Right based on what they were thinking at that time. You know, the, the final submission plans, we... I'd be happy, I guess if they could take a Google map shot, map shot and draw a red line on it, you know, with something we could navigate with. I, I, I could go with, uh, with Victoria's suggestion, and that is if, if we don't feel good about the information they present at the next meeting, then we can say, nah, no, we're going to have to. Yeah, you can't, you can't really decide in advance of the application whether or not you're going to have a site walk. Mm -hmm. No. So I, I think so. I'm, I'm with Victoria's suggestion. We, can, we do hold both things, and then if information comes forth that we're not comfortable with, and then it would be majority if the majority still said, if the majority said, it's fine, I'm, I'm good with it the way it is, then. And maybe we could have Maureen reach out to the applicant just to find out about buying the materials or something that might 
delay the project? To, um, what's their drop dead date? My, my sense is that they could get a good sense from you April 24th whether or not it makes sense to go ahead with purchasing materials. Sounds good. All right, so we will put them on the agenda for completeness and a public hearing. Do you need a motion? No, I just need a direction. Is, is it possible to put them on for approval? Maybe we won't get to approval, but just in case, so well, the notice is sent out? Right. What I would do is I would advertise both, and the way the advertising says is that you're going to consider completeness, and if it's deemed complete, then a public hearing will be held the same night. And after the public hearing, it's ripe for a vote for approval. Okay. So you can, after the public hearing, you can choose to approve it, you can choose to table it, it's up to you. Isn't that true of any project that Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. It was, it was just with this one, typically it's asked of you at the workshop, and I didn't think it was appropriate for staff to make that decision. Yeah. So, okay. So I, uh, now it's uh, time for public comment for items not on the agenda, but it's, we're, it's just us. Uh, do I have another motion? Move we adjourn. Oh, I like that. <laughs> what? In a second. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. Guys, I forgot my head count for Thursday night, which I remind oh. you, you Thursday night coming up. Uh, two, three, 